San Francisco, a far cry from the tiny village of shacks that predated the gold rush. San Francisco today is one of the most pleasantly diverse cities anywhere, strikingly modern, yet brimming with history, just like its fire department, unique in many ways. San Francisco is an important financial, industrial, and tourist center. Cultures of many nations blend into a single cosmopolitan population 730,000 strong. This Pacific Peninsula is virtually surrounded by water. Its temperate marine climate includes a bay mist that frequently adds a touch of drama to the city's natural beauty. The San Francisco Fire Department has 1,600 officers and firefighters. The city's 49 square miles are divided into three divisions and 10 battalions. Each division and battalion chief has an aide, or using local terminology, operators. Also in tradition, chief's vehicles are still sometimes called buggies. Each of the 41 fire stations has an engine company. Manning is an officer and three firefighters. Truck companies, all 100-foot tractor-drawn aerials, total 18. Their crew includes an officer and four firefighters. The city's two heavy rescues each have an officer and three firefighters. The department's extensive roster of special apparatus includes four hose tenders carrying up to 5,000 feet of 5-inch hose and renowned Gorter turrets. Three attack hose tenders have squirt articulating booms. The department fleet includes a hazardous materials van, a searchlight truck, a rare American La France fuel truck, and this strange-looking rig acquired with the aid of a local utility. It has a giant tank of carbon dioxide and a hydraulic boom to send the CO2 into burning underground electrical vaults, reducing the risk to firefighters. San Francisco's extensive shoreline and terrain have given rise to a pair of highly trained special rescue teams, a surf rescue unit for water-related incidents at lakes, the bay, and most often the ocean, and a cliff rescue unit, which in its first two years has rescued 40 climbers. Some of the department's most historic rigs are preserved officially on museum status and housed in a number of fire stations. Vintage pieces like this 64-year-old Mac Bulldog water tower. San Francisco's fire history is both rich and tragic. When gold was discovered, the population exploded from a few hundred to nearly 30,000. Fire quickly wiped out the settlement no less than six times. A half century later, a bigger disaster struck. In 1906, an earthquake destroyed part of the city, and within days, fire leveled the rest, 478 blocks. It was the greatest conflagration the world had seen. San Franciscans, jolted most recently in 1989, are a people living on the edge. For Chief Frederick Postel and the San Francisco Fire Department, it's just another challenge. Take, for example, the daily worry of weather, roller coaster hills, and construction. It's a windy city, and uh, it's windy that we have predominant winds coming off of the ocean from the west, and it's a hilly city on top of that. So uh, the construction in San Francisco is mainly wood frame construction. About 60% of our buildings are wood frame buildings, uh, three and four story buildings, and uh, they're built next to each other. So you get a fire at the bottom of a hill, for example, and a good wind, those fires can easily run the hills since they'll burn up at those hills. Uh, so that's certainly a problem. Add to it 490 high-rises and some very diverse neighborhoods. You take uh, the Chinatown area, for example, uh, that's very densely populated, uh, a lot of uh, unreinforced masonry building, uh, Buildings are real crowded, and the, the people, the buildings, the occupants crowd the building up. Uh, uh, there's a tremendous amount of, of, uh, of foot traffic on the streets. The streets are very narrow, and uh, again, that presents uh, very unique problems in that area uh, for firefighting. Uh, you have the North Beach area, which is uh, uh, a predominantly Italian area of San Francisco and uh, in that area is a very hilly area with three and four story what we call them flats here uh, that are built up on the side of the hill I mean actually hanging right off on the side of those hills uh, that is unique and different from other 
it from the say the Chinatown area that's adjacent to it. I mean, we have our financial district of San Francisco, which is all high-rise buildings, and uh, that presents again another problem. And that problem makes a transition from the daytime when. Everybody is in San Francisco working from the surrounding suburbs and, and our population swells to over a million and a half uh, to the nighttime when those buildings are mostly vacant and, uh, and that population has returned to their homes. It's a, it's a great city, a lot of flavor. Some of the city is still recovering from the earthquake of 1989. This building rises on the corner where a similar building collapsed in flames. It happened as millions of television viewers worldwide, ready to enjoy Game 3 of the World Series nearby, shared instead a ringside seat to disaster unfolding. The fire department brought many of its key people together in a task force that analyzed its response to the deadly event. One conclusion? You can never have enough training. And the training that is necessary around dealing with structural collapse and uh, urban search and rescue is, uh, is much more technical than the regular day-to-day -day training. It's, it's the kind of training that needs to be added to every department. San Francisco continues to prepare for the next quake. Aware of the government's projection of 67% probability, the city will be rocked by an even stronger quake within 30 years. Today, the department is part of the Urban Search and Rescue Task Force, a nationwide mutual aid system of emergency services specialists. And that will be, um, that'll be something that will demand a lot of energy and a lot of training. It'll do everybody a... Uh, It'll put everybody in better position to deal with their own emergency problems in their own area on a day-to-day -day basis. It'll also prepare them to be able to help others when we have a larger scale emergency in an in a individual location anywhere in the United States. San Francisco knows what an earthquake can do to its water supply. In 1906, it, like the city, was all but wiped out. Today, the city has a fascinatingly redundant system for delivering water to major fires, as designers have tried to outwit Mother Nature's destructiveness. Hydrants on the city's domestic water lines dot every corner, but firefighters are never far from a high-pressure hydrant, part of a separate water system maintained exclusively by the fire department. It is designed to suffer fewer breaks from earthquakes, and sections that do fail can be isolated by closing valves. The high-pressure system is fed by two monstrous storage tanks and a ten-and-a-half million gallon reservoir in the center of the city atop Twin Peaks. The Jones Street and Ashbury tanks are manned round the clock. This tank at Jones Street holds 750,000 gallons. The operator can regulate distribution to the fire scene by operating a network of valves. Engine companies using high-pressure hydrants first attach special valves to reduce the up to 300 pounds pressure these hefty hydrants pack. The fire department also maintains two bayside pumping stations, which, if necessary, send salt water into the high-pressure system. What we have are salt water uh, pumping stations that were originally made or built uh, 1917 approximately after the earthquake 1906 they're here to supply uh, salt water in the event of an emergency to our high pressure system in the city this particular station is pump station number two located at the foot of Van Ness Avenue here in San Francisco uh, our pumps are Byron Jackson pumps they supply uh, 2700 gallons per minute uh, water at 300 pounds uh, 300 pounds per square inch when our prime movers move at about 1800 RPM. The city's two fireboats can also feed the high pressure system by pumping into special manifolds located along the waterfront. And as if that's not enough, there are 152 underground cisterns available throughout the city, each containing 75,000 to a quarter million gallons of water for drafting. On the drawing board are dry hydrants for pumpers along the waterfront and 100 new cisterns. The city's water supply may not have made it through the quake of 89 intact, but its communication system did. 
The communications center sends companies out nearly 175 times a day, often to fires, but mostly to emergency medical service calls. All firefighters have various levels of EMS training, and with 41 stations, they're usually on the scene stabilizing patients before the arrival of the city's paramedics. Many alarms originate at street corner telegraph boxes. Their coded signal is received in the communication center. San Francisco has an enhanced 911 emergency phone system. Operators receiving fire calls pass them on to a fire dispatcher. The fire department proudly says San Franciscans in an emergency will see fire apparatus at their door within three minutes. Uh, when we receive a call, as we're receiving it, one of our uh, phone receivers, officers, are taking and putting that in, right into the computer. We will get an address, a phone number, etc., and we will put in the type of incident that we're responding to as he is talking. We will uh, then uh, get a location uh, verified with Cross Street, and that information instantaneously comes up on the screen, and it is uh, geared to the type of incident that we're responding to, and it will recommend whether we send one engine, two engine, three engines, uh, a fire aerial ladder, a battalion chief, a service squad, a rescue squad. This all comes up automatically. Next, computers print out details of the alarm for companies chosen to respond. A simultaneous voice message is broadcast throughout responding fire stations and over the department radio. We've already explained the novel way in which fireboats supply water to the high-pressure system, but the boats are primarily protectors of the city's waterfront. The legendary Phoenix is always at the ready with an officer, pilot, and engineer. The crew of Engine Company 35, quartered at the fireboat pier, serves double duty, hopping aboard the Phoenix whenever it gets a call. Built in 1954, the Phoenix has three engines and a trio of two-stage pumps capable of dishing out 9,600 gallons per minute. It's pretty much agreed the Phoenix saved the Marina District from further destruction by fire in the 1989 earthquake when it pumped five and a half million gallons through ten lines of three-inch hose stretched inland. It is, in fact, because of the earthquake the city has its second boat. Two anonymous residents of the Marina District donated $300,000 toward the purchase of the vessel from Vancouver, where it had been declared surplus. Six-year-old Christopher Smith won a school contest and named the boat Guardian. Though on special call only, Guardian, built in 1951 and reconstructed in 1972, stands ready to wallop a blazing ship or pier with 20,000 gallons per minute. There's another location that gets special protection from the fire department. The bustling San Francisco International Airport is a major destination from all points of the globe. Three officers and 14 firefighters are always on duty here. Uh, we service the people coming in and out of the terminal, which are a few thousand a day, uh, with first aid calls, falls, uh, stuck elevators. Uh, we have alarms, uh, fire alarms inside the buildings in the terminal complex, and water leaks, uh, sprinklers, the normal, one of the mill firefighting. The airport structure company and one crash company are housed in the main station. A second crash company is near the juncture of the airport's runways. And we get usually on the average a couple of alerts a day where uh, an aircraft will be coming in with fire warning light or a hydraulics problem and then the, uh, the big rigs will roll to standby positions at the runways and uh, escort the aircraft to the gate, check it out, make sure there's no problems. Like the city itself, the airport borders San Francisco Bay, thus the presence of three boats, an inflatable outboard, a Boston whaler, and a 2,000 gallon per minute aluminum fireboat. And then we also have our own contingent of uh, divers. We'll have um, one firefighter as a boat pilot that's on at all times, and we'll have two designated divers each day so that if we get a rescue, a water rescue of any type, we can send out uh, one of the officers uh, the pilot and two divers. 
The rich history of the San Francisco Fire Department is preserved here in a fire station museum sponsored by the St. Francis Hook and Ladder Society, the department's official historical arm. Several pieces of early apparatus are proudly displayed. Among them, San Francisco's first fire engine, a hand pump built in New York in 1810, shipped round the horn, and though destined for the mother load, commandeered from the docks by citizens to fight one of the town's many early conflagrations. One of San Francisco's landmarks is Telegraph Hill, topped by Coit Tower, named for one of the city's earliest fire buffs. Well, Lily Coit was a young teenager when she came to San Francisco in the early 1850s with her, with her parents. Uh, her mother was a, a, a Southern Belle aristocrat, and uh, she fell in love with the uh, volunteer fire companies of the time, in particular Knickerbocker No. 5. Uh, it was very fashionable for everybody in town to, uh, to be to any fire during that period. And uh, the, the fellows from uh, Knickerbocker adopted Lily Coit as their mascot. And she kept that relationship through her years, uh, assisting with the uh, uh, functions of the fire company. When she passed away in 1929, she left uh, $250,000 to beautify the city. And in 1932, they dedicated Coit Tower uh, in her name of her bequest. And also in that bequest, they erected a statue in Washington Square, which is one of the few fire statues in the United States dedicated to firemen. Another chapter of San Francisco history involves this fire hydrant at 20th and Church Streets. It is said that on the day after the 1906 earthquake, six young men using abandoned fire hose connected to this hydrant and sent water to a steamer two blocks away. Using lines from the steamer and doors from buildings as shields, they turned back flames advancing from downtown and saved the Mission District. The hydrant, able to provide water when all others were dry, is gilded each April 18th in commemoration. Some of the fire department's history is still alive at the central shops, Consider this. How many fire departments still construct their own ladders? Well, we, we built pretty much uh, uh, specialty ladders. Whatever they need, uh, uh, it, well, for instance, the, if the fire boat needs, uh, say, a boarding ladder, and it happens, and they want uh, a ladder that's, say, six feet, well, we'll make exactly what they want. And uh, the normal ladders that are, the hand ladders that are in the trucks, are they range from uh, 12 12 foot extensions to uh, 50 foot extensions and then everything in between 14 feet uh, 22 24 and uh, so this is a pretty wide uh, variety in an adjacent shop thick sheets of leather are transformed into special straps and belts worn by the city's firefighters and in another shop appliances and fittings are manufactured in some cases the same way they've been assembled for nearly a century this shop is the legacy of some of the Edisons of the fire service. Long before motorized apparatus, machinist Daniel Hayes patented the first successful aerial ladder. Machinist Henry Gorter designed a master stream monitor still found on the city's heavy-hitting hose tenders. And the valve engine companies employ to control pressure from high-pressure hydrants is named for its inventor, William Gleason. A principal function of this shop is maintenance and repair, but manufacturing is also an ongoing process. Uh, we have a pattern maker across the way, and uh, he makes the patterns. We go to a cast, and they deliver raw castings to us, and we machine them from, from scratch. Andy Enostroza says Hayes, Gorter, and Gleason may be gone, but the shop continues to modify and occasionally even invent tools and other equipment with valuable input from firefighters. We're constantly trying to improve what we do have, and we're open to suggestions, and we're, and we're also open to any prototype ideas that would help the fire department do their job. In this department of long traditions, change takes place too, if there's a reason. The tradition of San Francisco firefighters, well, that one will be around forever. Get to the fire quick, get inside, put it out, and, and they're very good at it. Uh, they also recognize that if a tradition isn't good, that you can't keep it. And uh, just to modernize, to modernize is not what we want to do. Firefighter Jeffrey Babb, 
A drugstore manager, Jeff decided to take the department exam after firefighters brought his seven-month-old son back to life after he had stopped breathing. I've already had the chance to reciprocate and uh, resuscitated the baby already. Um, I have, my confidence is greater. Uh, I've learned that uh, I'm capable of doing just about anything. Uh, I never thought I would scale a building with a small hook or rappel from a tower, but I've done so. And uh, I found that you can conquer your fears if uh, you want something bad enough. Jeff no longer worries whether drugstore shelves are stocked. In the fire department, he has new priorities. I visualize people stranded needing to be rescued. Uh, my heart's racing, uh, my adrenaline's flowing, whether it's two o'clock in the morning or five o'clock in the afternoon, I'm ready to go. Uh, I'm thinking about the duties, the immediate duties I have once I get off the rig. Firefighter Tom Gallegos joined the fire department 17 years ago. He calls it a life support system. People saving lives and keeping people alive. It, you never really experience that in other jobs that we're all a team, we're here to get the job done and get, it jo get the job done to the best of our ability. Tom's seen lots of changes in the department. More rules, more paperwork, minority hiring, a lot more EMS. But what it takes to be a firefighter, that hasn't changed. You kind of have to enjoy the danger and the excitement of a fire, the rush of going into a burning building. It takes somebody that, that's unselfish, willing to give the time. When somebody tells you, hey, there's a person trapped on the fire floor or possible uh, it's just one of those invincible things that you just kind of want to go out and extend your hand and, and try to save save that person and you really you become secondary chief postel is especially proud of his firefighters dedication and initiative but then he says that's what firefighters are all about when there's a problem they come up with a solution and the solution isn't always orthodox it's something sometimes very unusual and that's what throughout the earthquake and I think on a daily basis that's what San Francisco firefighters do and I know I've been around and that's what firefighters across the nation do is they use that initiative and uh, that's what held us in, in 1989 was the initiative and the dedication of San Francisco firefighters.